have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 2 Kings this morning. And what we normally do on Sunday mornings and the 9 a.m. is usually a more of an instructional aspect and give you some keys on how to live uh, your life accurately according to the Word of God. And then at 10 a.m., we tend to hit more, generally speaking, this isn't always the way it is, but then we try to, to go more along the lines of your day-to-day life and to help you and encourage you and to show you what God has for you. Uh, and then also, it is often when we minister uh, to the sick or to anyone that needs help. But uh, So this morning, we want to approach it from that position. I want you to go with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. <clears throat> and I've been talking about the basis of this for some time. Uh, but today we're going to go ahead and just bring it out and show you how to practice it and then how to get it into your life and show you the biblical reference for it. So 2 Kings chapter 4, starting at verse 8. Now I'll be reading both out of the King James, but also out of the ESV. Now, in the King James it says in verse 8, And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passes by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall. And let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. And it shall be when he comes to us that he shall turn in thither. So she's saying, she's talking to her husband and saying, Look, this guy stops by often. I perceive he is a holy man. And so let's build him a room. Let's just add on to the house. And so that way when he comes by here, he will have his own little room that he can stay in and he'll feel more comfortable there and he can actually stay here. And if we do that, he'll probably stay here more often. And it was a great blessing to have a man of God stay in their home. So she was trying to set it up. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> then he says, or she goes on to say, uh, verse 11, And it fell on a day that he came thither and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call the Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said unto him, Now notice, he, she stood before him, but he said unto him, meaning Gehazi, his servant. He didn't talk directly to the woman. Right? He talked to his servant, and his servant talked to the woman. Now, nowadays, that would almost be considered rude. You know, that he wouldn't talk to her directly, but... We also have to remember these were written uh, so that we could see that this would be a type and a shadow <clears throat> of Jesus. It would be a type and a shadow of the Father speaking to Jesus and Jesus to us. right? And then you move that down, it would be a type and a shadow of Jesus speaking to us and us to the people. Right? So you can see how this carries right on through. Then <clears throat> he says here in verse 13, And he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, You've been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for you? In other words, you've been nice to me. Now, what, what can I do for you? Would, wouldst thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host, the, head, the general of the army? And she answered, I dwell among mine own people. In other words, I don't, I don't need help from the king. I don't need any more protection from the army. So I, I'm, I'm good. I don't need any of that. <clears throat> and he said, what then is to be done for her? And you got a picture. This is going through Gehazi to the woman, and then he comes back and talks to him, and it's, it's kind of a process here. And Gehazi answered, Verily, she has no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Well, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door. And he said, About this season, according to the time of life, you will embrace a son. And she said, No, no, my Lord, uh, you... You man of God, don't lie to me. Don't lie, don't lie to your handmaid. <laughs> and the woman, now look at the verse 17. And the woman conceived. <laughs> and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her according to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. Now when it says the child was grown, it meant that as he was growing, he wasn't full grown. This was just a fairly short time after, a couple of years. <clears throat> and it said that um, he went to his father to the reaper, so he went out into the field. As a matter of fact, I'm going to switch over and read 
out of the uh, ESV at this point. It says, When the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers, and he said to his father, Oh, my head, my head. So, and it, from appearances, it looks like he might have had like a heat stroke or something like that going on. The father said to his servant, Carry him to his mother. And when he had lifted him and brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap till noon. And this is how we know that the child wasn't full grown, right? That he was growing, but he was still a young child. He sat on her lap till noon, and then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. Now think about this. So she's sitting there holding him. He dies. She takes him up to the room that she had prepared for the man of God, put him on the man of God's bed. She walks out, shuts the door, and walks away. Then she called to her husband and said, Send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys, that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. She said, I'm just going to run to the man of God and come back. Notice this. Now, this is, we're getting into the lesson. We're not just reading, right? Notice this. She doesn't say a word. Her son died. She doesn't even tell her husband. Doesn't say a word about it. Think about that. Now, you'd almost think, well, that's not right. But see how it ends and you'll find what's right. See, sometimes our, our, our customs, our, the way we do things, would preclude us from walking in faith. <clears throat> and he said, why will you go to him today? It's neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. In other words, there's no reason for you to go visit the preacher. You know, it's not a special day. It's, it's, not, it's not Sunday. There's no celebration. There's, there's nothing going on. There's nothing going on at the church. Why are you going up there? And she answers, all is well. Well, that's not an answer. He did, she didn't answer why she was going there. She said, all is well. Now, think about this. You look at this and you would automatically think, well, she just lied. Because all is not well. No, all is well because she's walking in faith. Do you get that? She's not looking at, oh, it's a horrible thing that happened. She's saying, yes, this is going on, and now it's going to end differently because I'm going to go to the man of God, and I'm going to get what I go for. And so she's not planning for failure. She's planning to get her son back. Amen? We see this also in the New Testament. There's something very similar to it, where the woman comes to Jesus, a woman of Canaan, a Syrophoenician woman, and says, uh, Lord, my, my, my daughter is grievously vexed of a devil. She's possessed. And Jesus, at, the, at that point, doesn't even really pay attention to her. But finally, he tells her, he says, you know, woman, it's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs because she wasn't of the, of the Jews who he was sent to. And she said, that's true, but even the dogs get, eat the crumbs from the master's table. And then Jesus says, woman, you've got some faith. Go your way, your daughter's healed. You notice he never said, daughter, be healed. He never said, demon, come out. So we put God in this box that we think that it's some kind of formula or the words that we say that are actually going to cause it to happen. And we have to realize that it's the faith in our heart toward God that actually releases God to be able to do the things for us that he wants to do. And all we, and really when it comes down to it, it's not even the actual words, even though it's good to say the right words. You definitely don't want to say the wrong words because then your words don't match your faith. But you want to be able to speak what God has, has put in your heart that matches your faith in Him. So here, she says, all is well. <clears throat> and notice, then, he, then she saddled the donkey, and she said to her servant, urge the animal on. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. In other words, let's get there. If it gets too rough, I'll tell you to slow down, but until, unless I say something, let's get there. And that would have been a rough ride, right? It's one thing riding a donkey when he's walking. It's a whole other thing when, he's, when you're riding a donkey and he's trying to run, because donkeys don't really run. They just kind of jerk around and you're just like this all the time. You know? Riding a donkey is kind of like riding a Shetland pony, if you know what that's like, right? Those are mean, vicious little critters, let me tell you, okay? <laughs> Shetland ponies are not, the, you always think, I'm gonna buy my child a Shetland pony because they're small, and it'll be good for them to learn on? No, they're mean. They will bite you, kick you. I mean, they're, 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 I guess, I don't know. You know, they used to, well, <laughs> probably shouldn't even go there, but I'm going to anyway. 
Um, <laughs> of the horse family, the Shetland pony is the animal that in modern language we would say they had little man syndrome. Now forget who's telling you that. So, okay, now. <laughs> But I'm telling you, these little Shetland ponies, they got an attitude, okay? So, now, hey, I'm a thousand times bigger on the inside, let me tell you, okay? So, let's just settle that, okay? Now, now watch this. It says in verse 25, So she set out, came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, his servant, Look, there's a Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the, with the child? And she answered, all is well. That's twice. Now, here the, the, the prophet is now asking her. You would think this would be the time that she could spill her guts. You know what I mean? Just, she could just cry out and say, oh, it's horrible. My son died and here's the sin. But he says, is, is everything okay? And she says, yep. Why? Because everything's in the plan. The plan is still working. You get that? She sees the plan working. It's working. <clears throat> then it says, And when she came to the mountain, to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet. So she comes up, drops down in front of him, grabs his feet, and Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, Leave her alone, for she is in bitter distress. And the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. You hear that? He's the prophet. And yet he doesn't even know what's going on yet. So it shows, but it, what's amazing to this is that God had to hide it from him. You see, it, it says God hid it. It didn't say that, that he, he couldn't see it or that he couldn't, you know, because honestly, the main thing about the prophets in the Old Testament, if you read their lives, things were just happening. It's almost as if they didn't have to try. And here it's as if God had to actually hide it from him or he would have known just by, by normal course of his prophetic calling he would have known what was going on. But God hid it from him. Now watch. It says, uh, verse 28. Then she said, Did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I ask you to do this for me? Did I ask you to give me a son? Because you remember, she didn't. Right? Did I ask her? Did I not say, don't deceive me? He said to Gehazi, Tie up your garment. And take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. Now, you hear the same language from Jesus about preaching the gospel. Jesus had the same urgency about preaching the gospel as this prophet did about raising the dead. And if you, if you know anything about raising the dead, there is a time element. Right? And if anyone greets you, do not reply. And lay my staff on the face of the child. Then the mother of the child said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. In other words, I'm not, I'm not going back home without you. If I go, you're coming. See, this woman had some grit. She's coming there, and, and, and it's amazing because the prophet had the power, but she had the guts to demand. So he arose and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound or sign of life. So the first thing the prophet did failed. You see that? It didn't work. It, it, at that point, the boy should have got up. That's what was being planned, but it didn't work that way. Therefore, he returned to meet him and told him, The child is not awakened. Look at the terminology. The same terminology Jesus used. The maid is not dead. She sleeps. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in, shut the door behind the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Well, that's just through contact. Then he got up again and walked once back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon him. So now he's done it twice. The child sneezed seven times. Now that's strange in and of itself right there. Okay. 
<clears throat> and the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and he said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her, and when she came to him, he said, Pick up your son. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. So now notice, this whole thing took place. It was real quick, but notice, and this is the key. Th this morning what I'm talking about is that faith speaks about tomorrow like it was yesterday. Because when she said all is well, all was not well to anybody but her. Why? And notice, she, doesn't, she didn't <clears throat> tell anybody, <clears throat> not even her husband. And so she said, get the donkey saddled up, let's go. And she went to the prophet, didn't say a word. And even when the prophet asked her, is all well with your husband, all well with you, all well with your son? She, you know, she didn't even, uh, it, uh, well, immediately, the first thing she started saying was, yeah, didn't I, did I ask you for a son? Now look, you gave me a son. You gave me this joy, the joy of my life, because we had, didn't have a child, and you gave me this son. I didn't ask you, you know. It was sad that I didn't have a child, but I was dealing with it. And then you gave me a son, and now he's dead. So now you've broken my heart. I didn't ask you for that. I asked you not to deceive me, not to put me in this position. So you did this, so you come fix it. Amen? You see that in the picture. And see, sometimes we look at this as, oh, look at what God did and God orchestrated this thing. And we have to realize that the prophets walked more like sons of God than most New Testament people do. Mm -hmm. They actually carried the power of God with them. And, and I could take you through time and time again where they actually, the prophets actually didn't even talk to God about stuff. Did things, miraculous things, just because they had the ability to do it because of their position. And yet... In today's world, we have a better position than the prophets. You realize even Elijah, Elisha, all the prophets died not having received the promise. God having provided some better thing for us. Because without us, they could not be made perfect, Hebrews says. So God made it. Now we are in a position. Our position in Christ is better than Elisha's position. Do you get that? Because Eli Elijah and Elisha, both of them, had their position as a prophet and they walked in power. And the beauty of that is that we walk in Jesus' position. Because he gave us his name and all authority is behind that name. Now, the problem is you have to look at how people in the Old Testament, particularly, <clears throat> New Testament too, and we'll see that in just a minute. But you have to look at how these people lived. Because I can guarantee you if... Most of the time, if a person today has a child that dies, they don't say all is well. Not even to the prophet, not even to the whoever they're trying to get to pray. It doesn't work that way. They have a whole different mindset. And the problem is that mindset doesn't work. So we have to get back to the mindset that the Bible shows us that we are to have. Now listen, this goes right in and we just finished the spiritual warfare seminar and if you remember the two main uh, disciplines or, or the two main characteristics of a spiritual warrior is discipline and perseverance <clears throat> and generally you won't have perseverance until you get some discipline and the first discipline and this is one of the things I thank God for whenever I first came into um, well actually at that time it was generally the word of faith message and it, it changed my life right Yes, there are excesses. Yes, there are people in it that do crazy stuff. But the, the basis, the, some of the fundamental things are accurate. It's biblical and it works. And so <clears throat> it was amazing because the first time I heard what people would call the confession message or the, 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 uh, con the doctrine of confessing God's word, it clicked. Why? Because I had seen the reality of it in, in, the, in the world system, you might say, and I saw how the world system had taken it and perverted it, and how even some Christians had taken it and perverted it. But I, saw, I knew it was a reality because it rang true in every area, not just the Bible, but in every other area too. And so I could look at that and see it. And so when I heard that, and then I, started, and I knew the Bible, I'd been reading the Bible all my life, 
and it just clicked. It's like, yes, that's that. There you go. You need to change your mouth. And so because of I had good discipline in my life at that point, I decided I will change my mouth. Sickness and death and disease and that stuff, poverty and like will never come out of my mouth again. I made that commitment and it stopped. And it, it wasn't always easy. There were things that wanted to come out. And especially uh, you get around people, you start joking, that kind of stuff. It's easy because certain uh, situations just kind of set up a good joke to speak sickness, disease, or death or something like that, which you wouldn't think it would, but I'm not being specific here, but it, but it does. And, you, and all of a sudden you, you hear that set up for that joke and you could say it and it'd be hilarious. And, but then you realize I can't say that. And that takes discipline to not say it. And so you have to get discipline in your life. And just like this woman. Now, I don't know what her discipline in her life was, but I can tell you anybody that their child dies and they say all is well and don't say a word negative to anybody, even her husband, that person's got discipline. That's a person who has learned to control their tongue. And if you control the tongue, you can turn the whole body according to James. And so if you're going to walk with God, if you're going to see God do things in your life, the first, one of the first steps, obviously getting born again, obviously making Jesus Lord, of course. But I'm saying as a Christian, if you're going to see God work in your life, the first major change you're going to make is in your mouth. And I'm not just talking about just speaking, you know, positive or positive thinking. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about speaking the Word of God and what the Word of God says. But I'm also talking about you have to decide. It's not ju just speaking the Word of God. Now, I'm, I'm not belittling the Word of God, obviously. You are speaking the Word of God, but there's also a way of speaking it. Right? If a policeman comes up into a situation and he walks up into the, you know, there's two people out arguing in the front yard and he gets a disturbance call and he shows up and he gets out of his car and walks up there and walks up to the people and kind of, you know, they're arguing back and forth. And he walks up and says, um, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Guess what? They ain't gonna, they're not going to pay any attention to him. Why? Because he doesn't know the authority he's got. You'll notice a policeman doesn't walk up and say, excuse me. A policeman walks right up in the middle, puts his hand up to shut him up. And then he says, now, you go right over there. I'll be with you in a minute. Now, you tell me what's going on. He, he doesn't ask. He tells them. Why? Because he knows his authority. And he knows that if the badge doesn't work, he's got a gun to back him up. Amen. Right? So we have to realize everything you speak has to come out of that authority. You can't just speak. Now, I'm not talking about being brash or rude or any of that. Kind. I'm not talking about that at all. <clears throat> Honestly, the more authority you have, the more you can afford to be polite. The more you can afford to be nice and, 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 and gentle toward people. But you have to realize that if you're going to speak, and I'm using this example, go, go with me. We're going to go to the next, next verse and we'll be uh, pretty much wrapped up on that. Okay. <clears throat> go with me to Mark. And the verse everybody knows. <clears throat> Half the people think Kenneth Hagin wrote this. Okay. He didn't. <laughs> okay. Go with me to Mark chapter 11. And you can, yeah, actually, you know what? Go to verse, yeah, verse 12. On the, on the following day, I'm reading from the ESV. On the following day when they were, came from Bethany, he was hungry, Jesus. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs, which proves to you that Jesus wasn't a farmer. Or he'd have known it wasn't a season for figs. Anyway, okay. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now, what does that mean? That means that he said it loud enough. Because Okay, let's read it again. Okay. It says, And seeing in the distance... Because they were coming, they were walking down the road from Bethany. Now, how many of you know trees don't grow in the middle of the road? Right? They grow on the side of the road. <clears throat> he was hungry, seeing in the distance a fig tree. In leaf. He went to it. He went to it. 
Now, he went to it. What does that mean? That could tell us that he left the disciples. They're in the road. They stop. He goes off to the fig tree and looks for figs, and there's no figs on it. And then he says to the fig tree, No man will eat fruit of you hereafter forever. And the disciples heard it. Now, they might have been three foot away, six foot away, ten foot away, ten yards away. It doesn't tell us. But we do know he spoke out loud to it because they heard it. Right? Now, and he didn't worry about them hearing it. You know, you, he could have been thinking, what are they going to think if I speak to a fig tree? I'm talking to a tree. They're going to think I'm crazy. And, they, and some people already thought he was crazy. Even his parents, at one point, the people went and talked to him. And his, his parents said, well, you know, he's just... That's Jesus, you know, he's a little strange. Then it says, No man eat fruit of you hereafter forever, or from, from you again. And the, his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem. So then they went on. And he entered the temple, began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. He could have added in their murderers too. <clears throat> for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. And as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look. The fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. You hear that? Whatever you believe in your heart and speak, it will be done. That's Jesus, who cannot lie. Right? Isn't that simple? Now, all right, let's take that back. All is well. Now, was all well? No, not in the sense of anybody looking on. But now notice, she said all is well. So what was she doing? She's talking about the future. As though it's the past. Isn't that right? Because all is not well, but all is going to be well. As soon as the answer comes, and she's already got it basically in the past tense. In other words, okay, this is, this is all over with. This, this is just something going on, and don't worry, I'm going to come out of the other side of this, and my son's going to be okay, and so it all is well. Do you get that? Yes. All right, now, the reason I'm telling you this, I, I, I didn't come in here this morning just to read a Bible story to you, or even to read Jesus' command to have faith in God. Do you realize that is a command? Have faith in God. That's an, that's an imperative statement, which means it's a command. And now notice, he says here, it was withered up. Jesus said, if you believe in your heart and speak, it will be done. Therefore, now watch, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer. Now you see, he just shifted conversation, right? First off, he's talking about just believing and talking. Then he's talking about prayer. So he goes from just everyday, common, you know, how you live your life. Then he says, and when you pray. So now he's shifting from everyday talk to specific prayer. Then he says, <clears throat> therefore I tell you, why? Therefore why? Because whatever you say and believe in your heart you will have, now that doesn't stop whenever you pray. So you have to pray the same way that matches that whatever you believe in your heart and say you will have. You get that? Your prayer cannot deny the truth that what you believe you will have if you say it. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Believe, okay, ask, believe that you have received and it shall be yours. Now, you just realize Jesus, is, Jesus has totally messed up the time uh, you know, continuum here, right? He says, so listen, because you will have whatever you say, if you believe it in your heart and you speak it out, you will have it. It will be in your life. Now, let's take, let's take that from the opposite direction. What is in your life today is what you have said and believed. You got that? You say, oh, no, I've got problems. No, listen to yourself talk. 
If you have problems in your life in these areas, it is because you have said it, you believed it, and you said it. And more than likely, you've talked it and talked it and talked it until it finally showed up. Now, he says, when you believe, or when you pray, let's start that way. So first you pray. But now you shouldn't just pray and just say anything. You have to realize that when you're praying, you're saying. And so you should be saying, when you pray, what you believe in your heart. You got that? Now, he didn't say, pray the facts. He said, pray what is in your heart. You got that? I'm going to take you through this step, step by step. And then he says, when you pray, whatever you're asking, obviously you're asking for something here. You, he said, whatever you ask for in prayer, right, when you pray, believe. Now, what are you going to believe? You're going to believe that what you're asking for, you receive. So you're going to believe that you receive when? When you pray. You got that, right? So when you pray, you believe that you receive it right then. Now, you believe you receive. He doesn't say, and when you pray, immediately you will see what you have prayed. He didn't say you'll see it. He said you'll believe it. And if you believe it, then you shall receive it. And you'll have it, as I should say. Because you're believing, you have received it, and now if you do that and you believe at that point, then you shall have it, which means what? You shall see it. So, you know, everybody always says, you know, seeing is believing. No, believing is seeing. Right. Right? You believe and then you see. But now notice this believing is what is vitally important, but then it goes to saying. And But you also have to realize that in the prayer, you have to be able to speak, believe you receive it right now, Right when you pray, so right then you have to decide this is done, right? And, and this is really, <clears throat> well, you know, this is the battle. This is, this is the crux of it. If you don't get this right, you will always be dependent on someone else to get your needs met. And so whenever I first started in this and we started working the principles of God the way he said to do it, uh, and then... We saw some things happen. It was amazing. And then after that, my daughter passed away, and it, it kind of it, it didn't shake us from God, but it, it shook us from some of the ways that we had heard some things. And so we started going in and researching some things and, and recognizing some things. But this did not change. This, this held solid. Now, how some people practiced it, yeah, they, they were wrong. But we started, we believed God, and we started applying this. And I decided at that point, as a matter of fact, whenever we buried our daughter, I decided at that point, <clears throat> I will never turn another one of my children over to somebody else to take care of. God gave my children to me. We will deal with whatever problems come up. Because whenever my daughter died and, and the ambulance got there and they took her, we didn't see her again until the funeral. Right? And so I, and I knew that, you know, we just... God had given my children to us to, to take care of and to raise, and I decided right then I would never turn that responsibility over to anybody else. And so we, we haven't. And whenever my, actually my third daughter, fell out of the window and died, I didn't jump on the phone and call the ambulance because the same thing would have happened. We would have buried another one. And that's exactly what Satan was yelling in my ear. You're burying another one. You're going to lose another one. You're going to bury another one. He even showed me the first funeral. I saw it. I was reliving the whole thing. But all that time, what came out of my mouth was, in the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. Why? Because I knew this verse and I stuck to it. And I did not let anything else come out of my mouth. I'd had time to practice. It had been about uh, eight years. Yeah, about eight years difference from the time we buried Erica until Rebecca fell out of the window. And so I had time to practice and get the discipline there. And God knew that. And, and I thank God that he took us into this truth. But, and the reason I'm telling you this is because I want you to realize you, this, is, this is not something you can do. This is Christianity. This is part of it. This is what you learn and you grow and you, you, you take on new behaviors and you have to start thinking differently. Now, the one thing, and this is something you know you don't generally hear, I don't guess. I'm trying to think if I've ever heard anybody say it before. But we are to, 
if you take this in alignment with Ephesians chapter 4, that we are to grow up into Him, Jesus, which is the head of all things, the head of the church of all things, right? If we are to grow up to be like Him, well, this is what, what, what Jesus is talking about in Mark eleven twenty four. 24 about praying, believing, receiving, guess what? That means that this is how Jesus operated. And if we're going to grow up to be Him, to be like Him in everything, then we're going to be functioning just like He did. We're going to be talking just like He did, right? Now you say, well, but He spoke to a fig tree. Yeah, you can speak to your problem. And you will tell it. No. And now notice, He didn't just say, give me a fig. He said, uh, you didn't do your job, what you were on this earth to do, because everything God created was meant to multiply and reproduce. So Jesus pronounced judgment and said, you're not doing what God put you here, so you will never accomplish God's will. From now on, you will never produce food for anybody. And Peter called that a curse. You don't see Jesus saying, I curse you. But Jesus telling this fig tree it will never accomplish its divine purpose was a curse. You get it? Because it was disobedient and did not produce. You say, but it wasn't the time for figs. Well, all that tells us is that when Jesus walked up to it, it should, should have produced anyway. Why? Because Jesus was walking as the last Adam. And so it wasn't about seasons. It was about the, the, the Lord of the harvest, okay, the, the husbandman, the, the, the owner of the vineyard, showed up and this thing should have produced. And what does that mean? Do you realize that Jesus, according to Peter, cursed this fig tree because it didn't produce out of season? Now think about it. You think, that doesn't sound fair. But if Jesus needs something, it should be there. Right? Well, and be, we look at these things as though, well, there has to be a, a season for this. And there's all kinds of teachings on seasons. You know, well, I'm in this season of my life. I'm this, this. No. Not in the New Testament. In the New Covenant, it's not, a, it's not a seasonal thing. It is you are provided for. God is your provider, and He can provide even out of season. Right? He didn't tell you, well, it's not, not season, so starve. He, didn't, he doesn't do that. He provides no matter what. I'm trying to get across to you. God is so big that He can, he can supersede natural law to accomplish what you need. Right? Now, understand, I'm not just saying, well, you know, your needs are you know, paramount in God's mind in that sense. But whenever you make God's needs your needs, you can bet that God's going to supply your need. And what I mean by that is when you make saving the lost your need, well, guess what? That's God's need. God needs the lost saved. When you, when you make his mission your need, you can bet that God is going to meet your needs. So if you want to see your needs met, just make God's needs your needs. It's really simple. When I started feeding and helping people and doing and taking people, let's just say, taking people's uh, needs as my own, that's when I started really seeing the blessing of God because not only did God meet the needs of the people that I had taken on, but he also met my needs in the process. Why? Because I got my mind off of me and started looking at the needs of the people and what they needed. But now Jesus did this exact same thing. Now look at, well here we have the Shunammite woman, and she says all is well. <clears throat> then Jesus, in his life, you've got these people come to Jesus and said, hey listen, Lazarus is sick, and he's, he's at the point of death. You need to get back there as quick as you can. And Jesus stayed another two days there. Why? Because Lazarus was already dead. Whenever Jesus heard that, he was already dead. And at one point, Jesus even told them, they said, you know, don't, don't you think we need to go back? And he says, no, he, he, he sleeps. And they said, well, if he's sleeping, then he'll be okay. And Jesus said, no, you don't get it. He's dead. You know, yeah, I'm trying not to say death, but you're making me. And he said, now we got to go because I got to go wake him up. <clears throat> but he didn't respond by saying, oh, Lazarus is dead. He responded by saying he sleeps. And then when he gets there, what is amazing is everybody's crying, all the stuff's going on, and, you know, you got Mary and Martha, and they're coming to Jesus and saying, oh, if you'd have been here. You know, really, they're saying, it's your fault, he's dead. If you'd have come when we sent for you. But now look at you, you, you know, what could have been so important that you waited extra days, or what could have been so important that you didn't come as soon as you heard? And yet, <clears throat> Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? 
Didn't I tell you? And, you know, don't you believe that your, your brother uh, is going to rise again? Oh, yeah, we know he's going to rise again in the resurrection. No, no, you don't understand. I am the resurrection. If I'm here, life is here. Right? So we have to realize Jesus' mindset. I mean, okay, let's just be ridiculously redundant or obvious about this. Jesus had the mind of Christ. Okay? <laughs> it might, yeah, it might be a shock here to some people. But he actually had the mind of Christ. And so we see how he thinks. So now we know, 1 Corinthians 2, 16, tells us that we have the mind of Christ. So how are we to be thinking? Exactly like he did. Exactly. So, but if we're, and if we're going to think the way he did, then we're going to talk the way he did. So the real essence, all I'm trying to get across to you this morning is you have to start to learn and practice and get disciplined to talk about today, <clears throat> you know, or tomorrow I should say even, as though it were yesterday. You have to be able to say, all is well. Not, here's my list of problems. Now, if you're going to let somebody else do all your stuff for you, yeah, come with your list. But if you're going to learn to walk in the power of God and have things happen for you, on, you know, between you and God, which is the essence of Christianity, is that you have a direct connection with God. Too many people try to turn Christianity back into Judaism where we have a, a, this priest system and we got to get to the man of God, kind of like the woman did. I got to go to him to get it. And we turn it into that rather than going directly to God ourselves, because we have that opportunity through Jesus to go directly to God. <clears throat> and the purpose of the people that we look at and say, well, if I can get to them, I can get this. And we need to realize that the purpose of the people you're talking about, their purpose is to make sure that you know how to walk in faith, hopefully like they do. You know, hope, hopefully they are walking in faith too. So we have to, the purpose is not to get to them because they're special. The idea is that they are training us to be like them. Uh, again, you've heard me mention this a lot <clears throat> every evening uh, when I go home in the last couple of weeks especially. Uh, I pulled out a bunch of Dr. Summerall's old videos and things and started going through them. And most of you have heard me say this and you, you'll see the difference and hopefully you can you know, see the difference, I should say. Uh, I've always told people, you know, because people say, well, you're just trying to make everybody, you know, like you. And I've always said, I'm not trying to make everybody like me. I'm, I'm really trying to make everybody like Jesus. I, you know, I, and I've even said before, I don't even want to be like me. Why would I want to make you like me, right? Uh, because I'm working on being more like Jesus. And that's my intent. And that's what I mean. And, but it was funny because I think it was uh, last night or night before, night before, I was listening to Dr. Summerall. And man, you know, you just... You, have, I'll just say, have any of you ever maybe got either one of my teachings on CD or something, and, or somebody else, anybody else's, and you've listened to them before, but the next time you listen to them, you hear something new? Yeah. Yeah. And you think, how did I miss that? You know, because this time when you hear it, it's like, bam, right in your face, and you're like, whoa, that, that man, that hits. That's, that's what I needed, or what, and, and yet, there, it, it's not new. It's on a CD. It was already on there. It didn't get added on there, right? It was there. You just didn't hear it. And it could be maybe you heard something just before that and you're writing or you're thinking and you're not hearing it or it, you know, it takes you off somewhere. To me, a good, a good teaching CD is one that I don't get to go all the way through. It's one I have to stop about every two minutes and either make notes or I, I, you know, I'll listen for two minutes and I'll pause it and then think for an hour or two while I'm driving. And then I come back in and I'm like, I get all this lined out and I, and I push play again and listen for another two minutes. For, oh, there it is. To me, that's a good teaching. Why? Because it's not just going all the way through. It actually causes you to actually engage what's being said. It makes you think about it. it. makes you dig into it. And so I'm listening uh, to Dr. Summerall on this, and, and he said, and, and it just shows where he was at, because whenever he said this, he was elderly. This, he was uh, actually in his early 80s. And it's the thing, as he got older, he got a lot more blunt. I mean, just... And, and <laughs> I, uh, sometimes I watch those videos and I really kind of felt sorry for the people in South Bend because he was constantly saying, you know, I should be in New Orleans. That's where I was born. Down there, it's 80 degrees right now. And here up here, it's, you know, 20 below zero. And he's going on to them. He goes, and I, I don't know why I'm here, but God has me here. So it has to be for you because I wouldn't be here for me. <laughs> I mean, he's just blasting these people. You know, it's like, 
yeah, don't you feel warm and welcome, you know? And so he's going on, but he says, and so he said, and I was praying to God the other day about you people. And he said, and, and, and I'm trying to say, God, how am I going to get them to get this? Because they're not getting it. And he said, they should be walking in faith. And if they'd walk in faith, we could walk together and we could get more done. But right now I'm walking in faith and having to drag them along too. And he's talking to these people. And he's telling them, this is what I'm praying to God about you. That I got to drag you along, right? So I'm thinking, maybe some prayers just ought to be kept to yourself. You know? So, but I'm listening to him and he says, and God spoke back to him and told him, you need to reproduce. You need to reproduce yourself in them. They need to be like you. And so he said, so I found out my job is to make you like me. And I heard that. And I'm like, and, and I realized now what I generally say is exactly the opposite. Because I'm, I'm telling you, I'm trying to make you like Jesus. And when I say that, I'm, I'm accurate. I'm biblically accurate. But yet when he said that, he was also biblically accurate. Why? Because our job is to reproduce. Now, if you can't reproduce yourself, then you already know. And if you're afraid to reproduce yourself, you already know you need to change something. And so you need to have the discipline to change what you need to so that you have no fear of reproducing yourself. Just like Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Amen. Right? And, and I will tell you, when I, when I heard that, something clicked in me. Why? Because I realized that I have to, that in my growth, because I'm growing, right? I haven't reached the end yet. I'm still growing. My faith is still growing. And we've seen God do some amazing things. But I honestly believe, and I want to say, you know, just straight out, so, you know, God, angels, devils, Satan, you, everybody else can hear it too. I ain't seen nothing yet to what I plan to see. Why? Because we have just scratched the surface of God's power being used to help people. And we want to see much more. Amen? Amen. We don't want to be satisfied with what we have seen. I don't want to be, that's one of the things that really bugs me when I go to Tulsa. When I go to Tulsa, I'll turn on the television and I hear the same people preaching the same thing. They've been preaching for 40 years and they're telling the same testimonies and, and they don't have any new ones. And it bugs me when I hear that. And many of them, I can say those same testimonies right along with them. Just right, and and I, I told God, I said, I don't want to be that. And I will tell the testimonies of God. We'll thank God for them. But we ought to always have fresh manna. We ought to always have new testimonies, new things that are going on. And if you get to a place where you're not having new testimonies in, in your life, you need to go back and figure out where you went off the exit on God's highway. Because we should, every day should be brand new for us. Every day should be greater, better, moving forward, growing, seeing more done for the kingdom of God. But that requires a push. But the first thing it requires in you is to start to change, to think and speak the way Jesus did. We can't say we have his mind and that we're going to walk as he walked if we don't change our mind to think the way he did and to speak the way he did. It just won't work. So we have to be able to... And the thing is, this is going to get very... Um, for some, it'll get very boring. And for others, it's going to get annoying. Because some people just thrive on problems. They want to hear the newest problem. They want to hear the newest you know, complaint or gripe or whatever it is that's going on. What's the newest trouble going on? And whenever you learn to walk and speak like Jesus, you don't talk about that. You, you talk about what, what's going to be tomorrow, but you talk about it today as if it was yesterday, right? And so you're talking past tense most of the time. And you start to, this is what will happen. This is, I believed, I have received, I've got this now. Now watch, we'll see it. And so there has to be that change in us where, and, and really what we're trying to do here also is not just, I'm not here just trying to minister to people in the sense of laying hands on people and people getting healed. That's great. But the real job here is to get everybody to grow up so that we're working together in this because together, if we're all walking in faith, we can do more than individually. And it should be more than just in our lives. You know, yeah, our lives should be such, listen, the, 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 the situation in your life should be such that you don't have to dwell on it. In other words, your problems should be solved so that you can look at the problems that are facing the kingdom. Amen. So that you're not always looking inside and always saying, well, here's the problem and this is what's going on. And here's what's going on, you know, and I'm not sure if I'm going to keep my job. I'm not sure what's going on there. And, you know, my car's acting up and, you know, and my, I don't know what's wrong with my kids. They're just going crazy. I don't know what's wrong with them. 
Now, that's not how you should be living. Because if your mind's there, then your mind can't be on expanding the kingdom. And the reason we're on this earth is to expand the kingdom. Amen. That's why we're here. So we need to be getting our, live, our lives in order so that we can focus on advancing the kingdom. But to do that, that means you have to start changing what you say because what you believe will come out of your mouth. And if that's the case, then you need to start changing what you believe so that what you believe lines up with the Word of God so that the Word of God comes out of your mouth. And then you start looking ahead. Farmers don't go out and look in a field and go, well, there's, there's nothing growing. Well, did you plant something? Well, no. <laughs> but, you know, I, I just thought I would go ahead and get something anyway. No. Farmers plant today for a harvest tomorrow. But see, most people want the harvest today and they, hadn't, they didn't plant yesterday. Words are seeds. We know that from Mark chapter 4. Words are seeds. You need to plant today what you want tomorrow. But, and now listen. Now think about that. If your words are seeds and you're planting today, some of you don't want what you're going to get tomorrow because of the seeds you plant today. So you need to start planting seeds that matter today that will give you the harvest you want tomorrow. So what does that mean? Quit talking about the problems you had yesterday and today because those are seeds you're planting and you're going to reap them again tomorrow. Now you're letting the bad seed of today, the bad problems of today, become your harvest of tomorrow because now you're planting the seeds of words in tomorrow's harvest. So you have to, at some point, you have to say, you know what? It, there's the old saying, the best time to plant a tree uh, was 20 years ago. But the second best time to plant a tree is today. And so, yeah, okay, you've got problems. Some of them probably come because of some of the things you've said. Your words can be a snare. The enemy can use that. And so if that's the case, quit saying that and decide today. You, the problem's already there. We'll deal with those. But start saying today what you want tomorrow. Don't, start, don't keep saying today what you've got today or you'll have the same thing tomorrow. Start saying today what you want tomorrow. You get that? And when you start saying today what you want tomorrow, then when tomorrow gets here, you will actually have what you want rather than what you've had. Amen. And so you start saying these things. You start agreeing with God's word. You have to agree. You're not agreeing with God's word when you say, uh, God's going to heal me. That, that's not an agreement. God didn't say he's going to. He said he has. So start saying that. Well, but that'd be lying. I'm not asking you for the facts. I'm not asking how you feel. I'm asking what you believe. You see, it's not lying. What you believe, you're not, you're not believing what you... Okay, if you can only say what you feel, then you're the one that's lying because your body is lying against the Word of God. The Word of God says you're healed. So I'm not asking you for the facts. I'm not asking how you feel. I'm asking what you believe. And if you believe the Word of God, then you believe that by His stripes you were healed. So I'm asking you to say what you believe, not what you feel. Amen? Amen? And when you start saying what you believe instead of what you feel, you're not lying. You're saying what you believe. Don't, don't let somebody box you into a corner where you think you have to say what you feel. See, that's what they'll always try to do. They'll try to back you into a corner where you feel like you have to say what you feel. There's nothing in the Bible that says you have to say what you feel. And usually it's on the, only the devil or people that work for him that try to get you to say what you feel rather than say what you believe. That's why Smith Wigglesworth, they'd, they'd ask him, you know, what's it? He said, well, I, I, listen, I don't go by what I feel. I go by what I believe, and I believe the Word of God. And then you say what the Word of God says. So there is nothing anywhere that says you have to say what you feel. So don't let people make you say what you feel. Say what you believe. And if you say what you believe, and if you believe the Word of God, then what you feel will change. Amen. You know, if they ask you, how are you feeling? Well, here's what I believe. By stripes, I'm healed. Well, you know, I'm just trying to figure out how's it going. Right? And then you say, well, by stripes, I'm healed. That's what I believe. No, no, no. What, what do you feel? By stripes, I'm healed. That's what I believe. Amen. Right? Well, okay, well, you know, yeah, it's just ridiculous. you're in denial. Yep, I'm denying the devil to work in my body. Right? What I, I'm admitting what God says is true. And then the next day, the next week, whenever it is, you can call him back and say, hey, you still want to know how I feel? Yeah, I do. I feel great. Why? Because I believed and now I'm walking in it. 
Amen? Amen. Don't Listen, the Bible says have an answer ready for any person that asks you of the hope that lies in you. It does not say have an answer ready for anybody that asks you any question that they want to ask. If you have an answer ready, you should have an answer ready for the hope that lies in you. What is your hope? Well, your hope is that tomorrow you'll be healed, and if you apply faith to it, it shall be so. Remember, hope is not negative. Hope is the blueprint, as they said. Hope, hope gives you the plan. Hope gives you the idea that it is possible. Then you go in the Word of God and you find faith to apply to the hope, and then the hope becomes a blueprint that the faith surrounds to actually give you the structure of what you're believing. So there's nothing wrong with hope. You just can't stop with hope. Right? If you stop with hope, you know, well, we're just going to pray and hope, hope and pray. Well, guess what? You're not going to get far. You've got to hope and faith, and then you'll have. Amen? The hope gives you the structure for it. You know, it gives you the, the, the blueprint for it. And so because of that, then things will change. If you don't have hope, you'll never have faith to apply to anything. You get that? Faith is a substance of things hoped for. If you don't have hope, you got nothing to apply your faith to, and you'll never have what you really want because you're not hoping. Hope gives you something to put your faith on. Hope gives you the, 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 the um, what do they call it? Well, like the um, stakes, not the stakes, but like a tent. You know, the rods that hold up a tent? That's hope. And then faith is the covering that goes over it but it's those, those rods and that structure in there, the support, the, the frame, I guess we call it. It's the frame in it that you put your faith on. You got that? If you don't have hope, you'll never, you're, you, if you don't have hope, you just have a tent, and that's just called a tarp, right? And you just throw it on the ground, there it is flat. <laughs> so you need the frame of hope to give faith your structure so that you can walk in what you believe. Amen? Amen? But you do that with your words. You frame your life with your words. Amen. And your words give, they, they, they actually give uh, life into the faith that is in your heart that you speak at your mouth. You got that? So if whatever you want, what have you been having? I'm going to tell you now, if what you've been having is not what you want, step one, change your mouth. Start saying what you want, not what you've had. Say what you want. Amen? And yeah, we'll probably talk about more of this later on. But